My name is Deborah Seward and I work at the University of Cumbria where I'm a senior lecturer in education. I think I would describe it a bit like a marathon um, in that um, it's, you're in it for the long haul uh, in a lot of ways. At the beginning I think you start off um, with there's, there's a, because there's a large group of you there's that motivation um, to get going and keep going and you've got things to share with people and there's a lot of talk about the reading that you're doing and, and what you're interested in and those kinds of things um, and then once you get through that part one sort of a, apprenticeship of doing writing quite regularly um, you are almost left on your own so you've kind of broken away from the main pack you might not be with the leaders um, and you're very much kind of on your own getting on with it and trying to keep going with the challenge which is also a challenge because you've got a day job as well and so trying to balance the time and you have little spurts where you make quite a lot of progress and then you sort of slow up um, and maybe don't do very much for a little while and then you, certainly that was my experience and then you spurt up again and then you get the what I thought was sort of the sprint to the end because you're facing an end date um, and almost a deadline that you've got to meet and that really makes you focus in the last few couple of months where you're trying to get it done um, and then you, ha you know you're preparing for the viva um, and you're having that and then any amendments or anything that you need to do so it, it's quite intense at the end as well so it, it, I, th I was thinking about it and I thought it's, it's been a bit like a marathon where you've got those challenges of getting going, keeping going, and then because of work and family life, it comes in fits and spurts um, up to that little sprint to the end where you just want it finished. I, I really like the way it was structured because I like um, to meet people and discuss things. I'm not very good at online learning. Um, so for me, the residentials I thought were fantastic because I could block those periods out and that was my time and my study time um, and then there was the impetus in between to do something ready for the next residential. Um, I thought the networking, the connections and just the sharing with others and hearing what other people were thinking of doing um, was good. I think I'll probably advise anybody um, to probably have a bit of an idea of what they might like to do from the beginning. Um, I had an idea because I was involved in some research as I started um, and I basically took that on and developed that into my thesis or an aspect of that into my thesis. Um, so I did some of the assignments around that so it was a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it was interconnected. Um, and I particularly write, like the fact you had to write those assignments in part one because I think that got you into the habit of writing and meeting deadlines and, and just going through that, that research process but in a very small version of that. So I think that worked really well for me. Um, I think the second part, you're a bit more isolated um, and it's very much the kind of support that you can get um, from your supervisors um, but also just from colleagues and friends and obviously the support networks you have at home in terms of allowing you the, the kind of time and headspace um, to do it um, I think is important and I was lucky enough towards the end um, to get an eight week sabbatical from work and that was what really meant I could get on and, and finish it and I had quite a rigorous sort of time scale for myself in terms of working very early in the mornings and kind of splitting the day up into periods of writing, um, reading and analysing, editing, drafting um, and I, I kind of did that over the eight weeks and that was hugely helpful uh, in terms of, of just being able to do it without having to think about anything else. Um, so I think that was good and I think, I think the tutor's expertise here at Lancaster um, because they're so knowledgeable and you know they're, they're world renowned 
and so the kind of input that they give when you're doing the first part and the modules um, is really helpful and I, I think the person who, you know, the cog in the wheel that holds it all together is Alison uh, in terms of she keeps you on track and she makes sure you've got everything you need and if there's a problem she'll help you find a solution to the problem and everything else um, so she's absolutely brilliant um, so I think it it's been a very positive experience for me. It's been hard work and it's been very challenging and, and I've done all the things you shouldn't do when you do a PhD, so change job role, we've moved house. We've done all those things that really I would never advise anybody to do. Um, <laughs> so there have been points in the journey where I've stopped and had to get back on and get that momentum going, but my supervisor um, was really helpful with that and I think because my institution work with Lancaster I had a supervisor from both and my supervisor in my home institution was literally around the corner from me so he was very good at kind of going have you done this have you done that we need a meeting and, and just G, knowing when to G me up when I needed that extra little push if you like so that was really useful for me as well. For my thesis, I looked at, I, I was working um, on an undergraduate three year um, education degree which led to QTS for early years teachers, so for those wanting to teach children from three to seven. Um, and what I did was uh, I followed a group of seven students throughout their course and looked at the development of their teacher identity. Um, and one of the reasons for doing that is, is very much around the, the literature and the research that already exists which says it, um, that it's teacher identity that drives decision making on a daily basis in the classroom but all, it's also one of the key factors in um, not just the recruitment but also the retention of teachers um, and there, there is an issue with retention. Um, the programme that I was on we were having issues with students getting towards the end and saying actually I don't want to be a teacher and that there, is, there was that option for them to take a non-QTS route but we were having sometimes up to a quarter of the cohort going I don't want to be an, an early years teacher um, so there was something going on um, that I thought I would like to look a little bit more at um, so I followed these seven students throughout and interviewed them twice a year before their practicum and after their practicum. Um, so they got a chance to reflect and think about themselves as teachers um, and things like that. And um, it was really interesting um, from my point of view as a tutor on the programme in terms of thinking about what is it that we can do that will help these students and maybe retain them, not just on the programme but in their profession. Um, and what I found was that there were three main outcomes. Um, some of them had their identities transformed. So they became, although they retained core values, they became much more outward looking. Um, so it wasn't about them. It became about the children, it became about colleagues, and it became about communities. Um, so they, and there was a, a sort of a pattern. I can't say there was a definite pattern, but there was a sort of a pattern to that. Um, so that was one outcome. The other outcome was that some had their identity consolidated, so it didn't change as dramatically, um, but there was a, a change in it, in that they became aware of the responsibilities of being a teacher. Um, there was a student who had her identity consolidated and confirmed, um, and she didn't change at all, um, which was very interesting. Because I know now she's not actually in teaching, which I think is, is interesting in itself and, a, and there's probably a further study to be done there about who stays in the profession. Um, she said nothing had changed for her from the beginning to the end of the course. She was, she was still the same, she still believed the same and everything else was quite peripheral. And then the sad thing in a lot of ways that there were um, two students who rejected, so they were part of they were the only two out of the cohort actually who rejected becoming a teacher uh, and the reasons were largely around the performativity and accountability agenda and how education, especially for younger children, is becoming much more formal 
and it was there was a real clash of values and their beliefs about what good early years teaching was about with what the government and what schools were saying they needed. Um, and one opted out of QTS completely uh, and the other one graduated with QTS but has never taught. And she felt that she couldn't compromise those values. Um, whereas some of the others, although they face similar challenges through the course, they somehow managed to be a little bit pragmatic and almost play the game and do what the schools wanted to pass the placements, thinking, well, afterwards, you know, when I've got my own class, I can actually do hopefully a little bit more of what I want and what I think is the right thing to do for children. So that kind of process of becoming was quite different for them all um, and, and I think it's probably different for all students because they're all coming with their own personal experiences and histories um, but I was surprised at how we, I knew it was emotional, I was surprised at how emotional it was for them um, because as a tutor you see them getting a little emotional and you know that there are highs and lows and everything else but um, a lot of the time that was hidden and it wasn't until they were interviewed that a lot of it came tumbling out in a lot of ways. Um, so the, there were these different things that they were concerned about, which was, you know, the standards agenda in schools and the, the increasing formality of schooling. Um, there was the emotionality of it. Um, they all saw re relationships as being crucial. Um, and that was relationships not just with children, but understanding that they had a relationship with colleagues and had a responsibility towards children, families and colleagues and the wider school and the wider community uh, as well, which I thought was um, really interesting. Um, and what, what I've sort of recommended in a lot of ways is that uh, in degree programmes like that, um, certainly for early year students, I don't know whether it's the same for primary students, and I think possibly because they're working with two very different curricula, um, for them, they probably need, or it would be better if they had some kind of attachment to schools throughout the course, rather than being in uni university, being in school, being in university, being in school. So somehow having a, a journey that was a bit more um, seamless and there was where there's less boundary crossing for them. So possibly being attached to a school for every year of their undergraduate study. Um, and it, I mean, it, it was really interesting because I. I um, I had the opportunity to go to ESA in September and present internationally um, and there, was, there are so many international colleagues that are concerned about this as well um, and a lot of them seem to be going down the route of having teacher standards like we have as that definition of what it is to be a teacher but actually what these students were telling me was it's much more, there's much more to it than just this tick list that we have which actually is quite peripheral. There's so, so much much more in terms of becoming that teacher that we see ourselves as. So they had a very definite idea of how they'd like to be as a future self, as a future teacher in the profession.